Hey everyone, this is Matt with Learn Everything About Design. And in this video, we're gonna do a user interface overview for plasticity. Now, this is something that we did quite a while ago when it was in version 1.x. Uh, now that we're in a new version, I think it's just time that we update that content. So in this video, we're gonna go over the user interface, get you comfortable with where everything is located. And if you need more content, if you're looking for how-to content, I'll put some links in the description of this video. We've got a couple of different playlists and video series to get you started. This speaker is part of a series that we have or that's gonna be going on our website, learneverythingaboutdesign.com in just a little bit. It'll probably be somewhere in the five to $10 range to purchase. And that'll be 17 different videos over several hours of content in order to walk through modeling this. But for this video, we're focusing on the user interface. Now, do remember if you're looking to purchase Plasticity, we are an affiliate, so you can use the code LEAD10 at checkout and that'll save you 10%. So the first thing that we wanna understand in Plasticity is that this is a direct modeler. What I mean by that is there's no history, there's no timeline, there's no feature tree. So if you're coming from another CAD program, you just need to forget about that altogether. We're, we have on the left-hand side what's called an outliner. And the outliner will store things like groups so we can hide specific groups of things. So in this case, curves or hardware or other features. We also have sections for things like solids, which we can hide and show all the solids in that area. We have sheets, which are surfaces and plasticity, curves. And if we happen to use things like reference images, there'll be a section called empties. So in this outliner, we have the ability to do things like determine whether or not we wanna group certain items together. For example, a bunch of curves that were used to create this that really aren't needed, but we don't wanna delete them. We can store them in a group and simply just keep them hidden for now. As we hover over things in the outliner, you'll notice that there are a couple of different icons here. The icons do different things, but the main thing that you're gonna be focused on is the eyeball icon, which allows you to hide and show those things. Hiding and showing them can also be done by selecting them and hitting H on the keyboard. So H is the shortcut key for hide. So as we look at this outliner, at the very top, we'll also see there are three dots here, which allows us to expand all. There's also an up arrow, which allows us to collapse all. And then we also have a purple dot listed at the very top. And this tells me that this file is currently unsaved. So if I wanna save the file, I can do Control S, or I can go up to my P menu. The P menu, or typically a file drop-down menu, is where we would start a new file, where we would open a specific file, import or append. If we're doing things like adding reference images, that would be import, append, save, save as, export, and so on. We also have the option to save as startup scene. Every time we start a new file in Plasticity, we have a cube, we can change that. We've also got options to do things like manage our licenses, check the version that we're currently on, in this case, 24.1.8. And then we have our preferences. Getting comfortable with your preferences should be your first stop with that default cube on the screen. You wanna make sure that you're comfortable with the navigation, how you rotate, how you pan, how you zoom in and out, and whether or not you need to change any of these settings. We also have options for things like performance, depending on your specific system that you're running. You may find that you want to use a lower or a normal anti-aliasing. You may change the faceting quality, depending on how you feel it's performing in your system. We'll also get to it in just a little bit, but in the bottom right-hand corner, there is a performance dialog that shows us how we're doing, basically, how the system is responding to what we're doing. Inside of our preferences, there's also information about appearances. You can change things like the accent colors. For example, if I wanted things to be red instead of the default purple. We also have some neutral colors. There is not a light background as far as I'm aware. The, the background can be configured by changing it here, but all the defaults are gonna be these darker colors, these grays and blues. So if you wanna get in and do some manual configuration of those things you can, uh, but for the most part, the defaults are gonna be these darker gray colors, which I think most people prefer for eye strain, but you can configure it manually by going in here. As we scroll down a bit more, you can see that we can set our grid and units. There's a backup option that in terms of the recently saved versions. So if you wanna save multiple versions, you can configure your backup path. 
As we go to the server, uh, this has to do with Blender Bridge. So if you are connecting your plasticity to Blender, which we've done a couple of videos on, you wanna make sure that your local host and the port number matches between plasticity and between Blender when you have the Blender Bridge add-in. The space mouse support, if you are using a 3D device, then you wanna check here. And then there's some general settings here about automatically invoking commands, which I would suggest leaving this on and getting used to how it works because that's extremely powerful in terms of how fast you can model. So now that we've taken a look at the outliner as well as the P menu, at the top left, we have our selection modes. Now we can toggle to just select points. And if you're working with just curves, or if you're working with something else that has a lot of points on it, for example, some features like raised degree, you may want to toggle on just points. You can go to edges, faces, or objects. You can hold down the shift key and add or remove from your selection. And the numbers at the top of your keyboard, one, two, three, four, will let you go to those. Five will be select all or tab if you're not currently in any other sort of tool or dialog box. As we move around the user interface, we've got our command palette, which can be displayed in the center of the screen or by clicking the three dots in the bottom right. To display it in the center of the screen, you hit F on the keyboard. And once we're in here, we can start scrolling through all the commands that are available, or we can start typing something. So if we know that we want to do, for example, duplicate, we can start to type, we can see the shortcuts associated with that. And we can also right click and assign a new shortcut or add to favorites. When we add something to favorites, uh, it's a good idea to think about, for example, raise degree. When we add it to favorites and I hit the F key, it's gonna be listed directly under the F key search box. So if you wanna remove this, you can remove it from favorites, but it's basically building a small toolbox of tools that you use all the time, but maybe you don't want a shortcut key associated with that. So that is gonna be your command palette, which again is F on the keyboard, or you can come down and select these see all commands in the bottom right. Now, as we move around in the top right, we've got our view modes. And these are things like toggling between perspective and ortho, determining whether or not we see the overlay, which is the grid underneath here. So we can toggle that on and off. We have the X-ray mode, which lets us see all of the edges through the model, depending on whether or not we've got uh, certain matte caps or material settings turned on, it'll let you see through the model. Then we've got our render mode. We can right click and we can pick different materials. We can also take a look at things like draft analysis or zebra stripes, and we can go to you know different, different preloaded matte caps, determine whether or not we're seeing the edges. Again, you can turn those options on or off as to not, whether or not you're x-raying and looking through the model or if you're showing or hiding those edges. This bar on the right-hand side of the screen is our tools. Now these are tools for mostly creating curves. Uh, curves are gonna be used primarily to generate your 3D objects, whether they're surfaces or sheets or solid bodies. The curves menus in some cases will have a small arrow in the bottom left. And if that's the case, you hold down the left mouse button and it'll give you those other options. You can see here, we've got other options. Once you enable one of these options for these tools, you'll notice that it's highlighted in whatever accent color you picked in your preferences. And as soon as you hit escape, you'll be able to get off of that. At the very bottom, we have a couple of what are called primitives. And primitives are easy ways for us to generate solid bodies without having to create the curves first. So using the primitives is a great way to get started on a model if you don't want to build out things like polygons or rectangles or circles or whatever the case might be. The tools on the right-hand side will always be displayed in plasticity. In some cases, you'll find that some tools are contextual based on your selection, and the contextual tools will be displayed at the bottom of our screen. Now, in the case of the bottom of our screen or our command bar, as it's called, stuff on the bottom left will be there all the time. Things like move, rotate, and scale. We've got our Boolean. We've got our cut solid with curve, mirror, and then you'll notice that duplicate object has an option here for place solid or curve. We've got alternative duplicate, and then we've got duplicate object here. So you can play around with some of these. There are going to be plenty of other tools that we have access to, but these ones in the command bar will be there all the time. 
other tools will be based on your selection. So for example, if I select an object, you can see here that I've got some options to unjoin. I have some array options for rectangular and radial. There's an option to project, and then of course, see all commands. If instead of an object, I select a face, you'll notice that I get some more options, drafting the face, matching the face, which will allow us to replace that solid face with a different face if it's a curve, a sheet, or something like that. We've got sweep, and we've got revolve, and extrude, and loft, and so on. So a lot of these tools are going to be contextual, meaning it's based on the selection that you have on the screen. When I select an edge or edges instead of a face, or if I select curves, I'll get some different options. Anytime we're inside of an active tool, you'll also notice that the dialog box will display in the bottom left all the time, and the options that you have will display in the bottom right. So anytime we're using a tool, you may notice, especially with things like extrudes, or even if we're using the move command, for example, that's G on the keyboard, we can see move in the bottom left, and all the available options listed in the bottom right. So pay close attention based on your selection, based on what you're doing, you may notice that the command bar is going to change quite a bit and give you access to tools. So I already mentioned the performance listed here in the bottom right. Construction planes is an important section. We can go to default construction planes. So for example, if I left click on that, this is setting my default construction plane as XY. If I click on this one, it's setting it as YZ, and this one is XZ. The reason that's important is because as we begin to create curves, they are going to go to that construction plane. So if we switch to XY over here and we use the line tool again, that is going to be on that construction plane. If you double click it, it's going to go normal to that construction plane for you. We can also create custom construction planes by selecting a face, a planar face in this case, and hitting the space bar. And that'll create a temporary construction plane, which can then be saved as a saved construction plane. You know, we can make a plane from selection. We can also make a plane from the camera angle. So this can be helpful if you're trying to cut through a model at a specific angle. Now, when we do that, it's going to default to an orthographic view because we're looking normal to a construction plane. And once we're done with that, if you're in perspective mode, it'll switch back. We can hit the X to get off of our construction plane. Uh, so just keep in mind that you're not really generating or creating planes, but you do have the option to save those planes. And if you double click on them, it'll align to that view for you. And again, you can always hit X to get off of that and rotate back around. Above the construction plane section, we've got grids and snap. If you like to work by using snap to grid, then you do want to pay close attention to the way in which you set up your units and your grid and your preferences. You can see here that my grid size is 250 millimeters with accent lines every 25. Over here, we can enable snapping. And enabling snapping will allow us to snap to things like faces, curves, and edges. And we can toggle these off individually if we want. We also have the option to snap to grid, and we can give it a specific increment. So you'll notice that this is reconfiguring the size of my grid based on whatever I have set up here. And then when we start to create curves, it's going to snap to those positions. So if you like to work by snapping to a grid, then you can toggle this on and off as you go. But keep in mind that these settings will change based on your configuration. So for example, in our preferences, it was set our grid at 25 millimeters for the accent lines. But as soon as we start messing with grid snaps, it's going to reconfigure that to whatever we set inside of our grid snaps. This object here in the upper right hand corner is called our view cube. And we can use that by clicking on either the faces or by clicking on X, Y, and Z. And that'll allow us to toggle to those different planes. I know a lot of users that are using laptops complain about navigation and also the numpad because numpad one, three, and seven are gonna be our default views. I did a video on using plasticity with a laptop, which I'll put a link here as well. But you can also hold down Alt in the middle mouse wheel and you can kind of toggle left and right or up and down and snap to those ortho views. You can also use the F key to open up the command palette and start to type in view. 
And then you can reconfigure some of these shortcuts. So instead of numpad one, you can assign a new shortcut. Numpad one will still work, but you can configure it to something else that you have available to you. I did cover that in our how to use a laptop for plasticity video. So if you are looking to do that, make sure you do check out that video for some tips on how to make that work. That is gonna be the basic overview of the UI. Uh, to get started, does take a little bit of work, especially if you're coming from a different CAD package and you're not used to the interface and the way that plasticity works. But hopefully this helps you identify all the different areas inside of the user interface. And if you have any questions, please let me know. As always, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.